thanks is here with we want to say a special word of welcome to you this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're here worshiping with us, and uh, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. And so uh, there's a special tear-out section in our bulletin, so if you get a chance, just fill that out, and you can lay it up here on this table at the end of the service. We promise we won't harass you or try to sell you an extended quarantine or, or sell your information or anything like that. So, <laughs> but uh, we are so glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we continue to worship this morning. Father God, we just want to thank you and praise you, God, and just give you all the glory and honor that's due your name this day. Thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy, for your love for us, God, just for, uh, just for all of you that sinners of Christ, God, and for us. Just thank you, Lord, for that. Just pray that you'll uh, work in each person here today, God, and just to uh, just, uh, just, uh, keep the church up to you, God, and just pray that you'll uh, work and move here in an awesome way. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to stand this morning as we continue to sing. Thank you. 
chapter 3. We're just going to look at two verses today and look at some other verses, but just want you to be encouraged today that God, the God that we just sung about, the God that we just sang to each other about, God is an awesome God. Amen. God is bigger than you and I could ever imagine. We talked uh, in the last couple times that I was here about how he works in and through the church in order to accomplish his purpose for the church. Even when we don't know what he's doing, God is working through his church. And you, my friends, and myself, we are the church. And last week, one of the comments that I made toward the end of the message was the true church cannot wait for one person to lead the way. The true church leads the way because we have the one person who is our king. Amen. And if we are the true church, if we're saved, if the Bible's true, if the Bible's real and true and we're saved, that we belong to him. We are his bride. And he's given us every blessing under heaven in order to accomplish his purpose. Amen. And he calls leaders and under shepherds to lead that way, to facilitate that way, to, to teach that way, to cast a vision for that way. But friends, it will always, always, always be up to the church 
to accomplish the mission of God. It will never be about a man. It will be about the king and what we do with the king. And so we get discouraged and sometimes disgruntled and sometimes impatient and sometimes just out and out nasty. When things aren't going fast enough and things aren't going the way we think they should, because we live in a Burger King world, have it your way. God does not operate in a Burger King world. He stands outside of our time. He stands outside of our essence. He stands outside. He is the Holy Other. And his timing is always perfect. God is never late. Seldom ever early. He's always on time. The Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus wrote this letter. And in verse 20 is a doxology that we read, but I don't think sometimes we celebrate it enough as a people. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul writes, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. How about that? That's so good. And since we're not reading a lot of text, let's just read that again. You ready? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, According to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Back in 2001, in the midst of an Israeli-Arab conflict, a motorcade carrying security service chief of Gaza came under bullet fire from Israeli troops. And the security officer was frightened and he called Yasser Arafat. For help from his car and Arafat turned and called the U.S. ambassador who called the then Secretary of State Colin Powell. Colin Powell phoned Ariel Sharon, the Israeli Prime Minister, who then ordered the shooting to stop immediately. And guess what? The shooting stopped immediately. The security chief's connection surely saved his life. In a similar way, Christians have a divine connection to the ultimate power of the universe that can make a world of difference in any situation. Amen. Let me say that again. Christians have a divine connection to the ultimate power of the universe that can make a world of difference in any situation. Amen. These two verses conclude the first half of Ephesians. The first three chapters concern doctrine telling us of our wealth in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 through 3 clearly give an account to the incredible riches that belong to the church. Paul doesn't waste any time in getting to this point. When he starts the book of Ephesians, or the letter to the church in Ephesus, what we read is chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let me tell you something. If you were a church in that time, and you were getting brutalized, beat up, and, uh, and uh, suffering persecution, that would be a great opening salutation. If you needed encouragement, friends, if you need encouragement today, that is a great opening salutation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, not just some, not just a few, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Now that truth says this, you and I need nothing more than Jesus to experience the blessing of heaven. Amen. No more and no less. Say amen if you're awake. Amen. 
You've already received it. He says to the believers, listen, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to pray for it. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to worship for it. You don't have to go to church for it. If you're a believer, you have it. Every spiritual blessing under heaven in Christ, blessed be the God and Father of our Savior. Isn't that awesome? Significantly important. Because we have every blessing that we need for life and for godliness. If you're a child of God, of God if you're a child of the kingdom, you are a child of the creator of the universe. God didn't create just the things we like to enjoy. God created the wind. He created air. He created the sun. He created the stars. He created the moon. That is your heavenly father. Who could care about the important people that we are related to, that we look up to, that we sometimes wrongly idolize when you are related to the creator of the universe. If you're a believer, you're his child. If you're his child, he's your father. He is your blessed heavenly father. Amen. You're a child of the king. And friends, if you're a child of the king, you ought to live like you're a child of the king. No more hanging head and defeat. You should live like it. No more being ashamed of being a Christian. You should live victoriously. No more shuffling feet around, feeling like you may be a second-class citizen because the world is against you. You are a child of God, and the creator of heaven and earth says, you have every spiritual blessing under heaven. Ephesians 4 through 6 concerned duty. Tell us about our walk with Jesus. So it causes us to question, how do we walk? What does victory look like? It's a powerful, powerful letter. And at the end of Ephesians 3, Paul offers this prayer, this doxology, in which we learn, of course, a good Baptist sermon, these three things. Number one, God overrules our mind. He says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. God overrules the mind. I want you to, I want you to picture in your mind a number. Pick a number. I like quizzes. You, you can tell, right, by my being here. I like, I like little quizzes. Pick a number. Any number at all. You got one in your mind? Did anybody pick a number that was larger than one million? Raise your hand if you picked a number that was larger than one million. One, one person in the back. Anybody else? Why didn't you pick a number larger than a million? Why do we sometimes limit the number that we would pick? Follow me. In 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin incorporated what we know as Google today. They were still graduate students at Stanford University. Google was not the first search engine to be created in history, but with a 78.23% worldwide market share in 2019 alone, it of course has the dominant lead over all search engines ever manufactured or created. According to statistics, the top five search engines worldwide in terms of market share are Google, Bing, Yahoo, Beidou, and Yandex. Google is a dominant force in search engines, and one of the most popular ones that we could find. It really is the king, and probably always will be the king, for the foreseeable future, over all the search engines because of its algorithms. It's very powerful. Because of its leading marketing and advertising algorithms, the platform that you can join. Personalized user experience, Google is just the bomb. Dot com. <laughs> The rest of the U.S. market share, 11.63%, is divided between Bing, Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo. Global unique users per month, 380 million people. Considering that there are almost 4.39 billion internet users, the number of Google users worldwide is nearly 4 billion people. There are 246 million unique Google users in the U.S. alone, and Google Usage statistics show that Google Photos 
has over one billion active users, just Google Photos alone. In October 2019, the number of Google searches per second was more than 77,500 per second. Math calculations would show us then approximately 6.7 billion searches happen on Google search every day on their search engine. Just to compare the number of daily Google users, the number of Google searches back in 1998 was 10,000. So that number shows that Google, the search engine Google, its usage, uh, is huge, but what percent of the people on the internet are using other Google services besides that search engine? YouTube has over 1.9 billion active users. <coughs> Google Chrome, the most popular browser with a market share of 69.28%. According to Google statistics, Gmail has more than 1.5 billion active users. There are more than 2.5 billion Android-powered devices worldwide. One of the less well-known Google facts is that there are more than 2 million accounts on Google Ads. There are more than 2.9 million companies that use one or more of Google's marketing services. The 4 billion Google users in 2019 account for 52% of the entire world population. And not only that, but Google aims to increase its user base even further. Are you following me? Here's a fun fact about Google. Do you know how many times that Google has been Googled. As of July 2019, there were almost 85 million searches just for the word Google. It ranks fifth in the most popular Google searches. Now, you're probably wondering what is the most searched thing on Google ever? According to most statistics, Facebook followed by YouTube, Amazon, and Gmail are the top Google searches in word. But why the word Google? When they created Google, these guys, they picked the word Google because Google is a mathematical term. Any math teachers in here? Anybody? Google is a math, you won't know if I'm telling you the truth or not then. <laughs> Let's be taped. The word Google is a mathematical term. G-O-O-G-O-L is how it's spelled. And Google is a mathematical term, it's one, followed by 100 zeros. Most people are likely, when asked to pick a number, to pick a number between one and 10, maybe 15 and 100. But these guys decided to pick Google, one followed by 100 zeros. Former chief operations and engineer of Google, Jim Reese said, it takes a lot of confidence and courage to go ahead and do that, to be huge. It's rare to find people who think on such a grand scale and are able to create a great product at the same time. Why am I saying all this? Why do we put a lid on God's jar? Did you hear that? Why do we put a lid on God's jar? When we pray, friends, when we pray to God, we ought to be thinking on a grand scale. We ought to be thinking in, in, in terms that only God could define. When faith grows in a church, that church can accomplish exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ask We need to understand that God is able. God is able. Say that with me. God is able. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think. And we have illustrations of this in the Bible. Genesis 149, the story of Joseph. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. That was God putting Joseph in a place to gather grain to get ready for a seven-year famine. The Queen of Sheba found Solomon's empire beyond anything she could have imagined. 1 Kings 10.7 However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes 
and indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame in which I heard. Paul said this about heaven in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Eyes have not seen, ears have never heard, nothing's ever entered into the heart of man the things for which God has prepared for those who love him. Do you know that? You can't imagine the things that God has planned for you. You can't define the things that God has planned for you. You can never really understand and comprehend the good things that God has planned for you unless, unless you put a lid on the jar. And he'll allow you to do that. He'll allow you to put a lid on the jar. If for nothing else, to continue to show us the very thing that we know. With him, I'm everything. Without him, I'm nothing. Paul had already talked about the incredible wealth in chapter 2 of Ephesians. The incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us. He wrote that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And in, in chapter 3, 20, 21 that we read, God's answers to prayer are beyond our ability to measure. They're beyond our ability to comprehend. or beyond our ability even to fully claim. God not only does what we can ask or imagine. He not only does all that we can ask or imagine. God does above all Amen. we can ask or imagine. He does abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. He does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. He overpowers our mind. Now, if we're true to ourselves, we know that we're weak. But here's a good thing. Since God has given us every spiritual blessing under heaven to live for him, he overcomes our weakness. Paul says it's going to be according to the power that is at work within us. He never wrote it's going to be according to the power which you can muster up after your second cup of coffee in the morning. He never wrote it's going to be according to the power that you can muster up after you and a group of friends get together, get into a think tank, plan, strategize, and get the thing done. Say amen if you're hearing me. He never wrote that. He said it's according to the power that is already working within us. The Bible says he does exceedingly abundantly above what we've been asking for and it's according to the power that works within us. And what is this power that's working within us? We know it's the Holy Spirit. Leonard Sweet in his Soul Cafe newsletter included the top 10 liars list. Number 10. I'm famous for this one. We're only going to stay five minutes. <laughs> Number nine. I'm also famous for this one. This is going to be a short one. <laughs> Number eight. I'm not going to say. Because we're in church. Yeah. But number seven, the check is in the mail. And if you're an adult, you know what number eight is. Yeah. Number six, I'm from the government. And I'm here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> number five, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> number four, your money will be cheerfully refunded. Number three, we service what we sell. Number two, your table will be ready in just a minute. And number one, I'll start exercising, I'll start dieting tomorrow. <laughs> now, fortunately, there is, there is a church list. There's a spiritual list of church life. Here's the Christian top five. Number one, you might just see us there Sunday, preacher. Number two, hey, this is just between me and you. 
Number three, Mrs. Smith, little Susie was a little high-spirited today in Sunday school. Yeah. Number four, I have, I have a few words to share from my heart today. Number five, when the preacher says, and in conclusion, or finally, my next, my final point is, I want to share with you another lie that we sometimes tell, and it will go something like this. My faith in God never wavers. My belief is always strong. In some ways, I wish that were true. But I know that that is not true. Each and every one of us have moments of doubt. Each and every one of us have prayed prayers. And as soon as we have prayed our prayers, we thought, that's not going to happen. Even the strongest among us have had times when we have been weak in our faith. And the good news is this. Because of what Paul is saying, the good news is God is going to take care of us. Amen. Because it's always going to be according to the power that he has that's working in us. Amen. So when it comes to the challenges of life, whether they concern our health or our finances, our families, our relationships, we find that God not only works according to our faith, but he works according to the power that is within us. In other words, God supplies the power that we, do, that we don't have. God supplies the faith that we don't possess. God supplies the abilities that we can only dream of. God's Spirit comes to us and gives us the assurance that while we can't accomplish much on our own, God's power can accomplish anything. Amen. So the question is this. Do we go to God in our weakness and tap into His power? Or do we simply just give in to our own limitations? Do we simply just put a lid on his jar? In Mark chapter 9, Jesus encountered a man whose son was overtaken by a demon. And the father wanted Jesus to heal him. In verse 22 of Mark chapter 9, here's what the father said. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. He says, Jesus, I have some faith, but it is not nearly as enough. I have some ability, but I don't have enough ability. Jesus, I believe I'm strong, but I'm weak right now. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, just in the spirit of transparency, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I find myself honoring the words of this father. Rather than saying my faith is growing stronger all the time, I say, Father, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. It's not a matter of having faith that's not sure of who God is. It's a matter of coming to the realization that my faith, no matter what quantity I could possess, is inadequate. To do the task that God has called me to do. So, God is incomprehensible. Would you agree with that? So, from that which is incomprehensible, God allows me to comprehend this point. I can achieve nothing on my own. I absolutely must be reliant on the power of God to see me through the task that he's called me to do. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand and accept the fact that we will not win people to Christ? We will not reach the kids in our community, in our area, because we feel like we have a faith that's 100% pure all the time? It won't happen. 
Well, we can win people to Jesus. We can reach the kids in our communities in our area. How? According to the power that is at work within us. It comes down to this. Is this going to be a me thing? Or is this going to be a God thing? It has to be a God thing. Because friends, if it's not a God thing, it's not worth doing. God things are the things that only God can do. And he will do in spite of our weakness. So God overrules my mind, overpowers my weakness. And God, man, God overflows our praise. Verse 21, he says, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul's telling us what our response is. To God should be this God who does exceedingly abundantly more and above all that we could ask or imagine according to the power that's worked within us what are our, what is our response how do we respond to something as great as this what would the reaction be surely surely we cannot sit back and do nothing can we surely that cannot be the response to God be the glory of the church by Christ Jesus to all generations Forever and ever. To God be the glory for my sickness. Hello? To God be the glory for saving my husband or my wife when they were lost. To God be the glory for granting me his mercy. To God be the glory for granting peace to a troubled soul. To God be the glory for Christian fellowship. Amen. To God be the glory for a voice that can sing praises to him. Amen. To God be the glory for a church family that cares. Amen. To God be the glory for opportunities to witness to the lost. Amen. To God be the glory, yes. To God be the glory for my children. Amen. To God be the glory for my parents. Amen. To God be the glory for our nation. To God be the glory for his promise of heaven. To God be the glory for the church Amen. of his son Jesus Christ. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There has to come a point in our lives and in the life of the church where, man, all we want to do is just praise God for all that he's done. And not only what he's done, but recognizing what he's continuing to do. And what we can trust him to do. Does that make sense? I believe the church needs to celebrate those times. And there's no better time than the present. Is today just such a time? I want you to notice the two places here that God says His glory will, will appear. He says it will appear in the church and in His Son. In the church and in His Son. Both the Son of God and His bride church have the ability to bring glory to God the Father. And it is through, it is by and it's in his church that God's name will be magnified. We don't come to God and praise him as individuals when we come together. It takes individuals to do this. But know this. We come together as a corporate family when we come together. And praise them together. Did you ever notice that when you're alone, walking through those doors, not knowing which end is up, discouraged, defeated, did you ever notice that there are days when you walk through those doors and God's Spirit reminds you that what's going on in your life isn't as bad as you think it is? Do you know why that happens? Because according to the power that is at work within us, God does not equip defeated children. Paul says that he did not give us a spirit of timidity. In other words, know this. If you're saved, you may be going through some stuff, but he's giving you a spirit of victory, a courage, a confidence, one of promise and hope. And sometimes when you walk through those doors, 
you feel so defeated, you don't allow anyone to get close to you. You don't allow people to talk to you. You just kind of sit soaking sour right in the chair that you sit in. But there are other days when you come in where you say, you know what, Lord, I just, I don't know what to do. I'm so defeated. I'm so discouraged. But I really do, I really do want to worship you today. And you find yourself for this, at least this one hour, at least this one hour, you find yourself able to fellowship, you find yourself able to sing, you find yourself able to listen, you find yourself able to pray, and you find yourself able to communicate with the abundantly, exceedingly, above all God Amen. that you came here to worship. And when you leave here, you leave here energized. Amen. That needs to be based on truth rather than emotion. Because if you leave your energized based on your emotion, you walk out that door, you jump in your car, and immediately you are defeated, discouraged, and done again. And you're constantly looking for the next high, the next service, the Wednesday night, the next Sunday, whatever it is, the Bible study, well, you're constantly looking for that next thing to get you out of that funk. People, trust me when I say this, God's word is true, it is trustworthy, it is 100% holy and absolute. If Jesus says you are given a spirit of victory, you are given a spirit of victory. Do not hang your head, do not walk in defeat, do not walk in discouragement, do not walk as if, as if you're the only one going through this life with all of these issues. You walk as a child of the king. Amen. Because he's given you power. And he can do exceedingly abundantly above all. Each of us individually find ourselves as a part of the whole. None of us is here to work in opposition with each other. All of us should be here to work with one another in unity. None of us are here to go forward on our own. All of us should be here to move forward together. Hand in hand, seeing God's will accomplished before our very eyes. None of us can make a difference by ourselves, but together with the church and with Christ as our head, we can change the world around us. Do you believe that? So you can't let past defeats, mistakes, and sin. Every single church, ever, 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 that existed on this earth. Ever. Listen to me. I'm going to say it one more time. Ever. Every single church that has ever existed has had past sin, past mistakes, and defeat. Do you know why? Because we're human. I can guarantee you, without knowing your history, you Bagham Heights Baptist Church, you have a history that includes sin, defeat, discouragement. I, you don't have to, I don't have to know your history. The fact that we're all human beings in this room tells me that that's true. And every time that that happens, it's happened because of this. Because we've taken our eye off of Jesus and put our eyes on ourselves. Every time. Every time. So God knows that. And the most important thing you and I can do in those moments is just agree with God that we've done messed up. Now, I don't know about you, but I probably messed up an hour ago. An hour and a half ago. Two hours ago. Three hours ago. Did anybody get up this morning and not mess up? Anybody? Because if he did, I want to talk to you after service. I need to learn something from you. Does that make sense? Now, if we keep it real, if we keep it real and we're honest, instead of trying to say, I want people to see me for something other than what I am, if you just be who you are, which is a person bent towards sin, a person bent towards selfishness, a person who's bent towards self-centeredness, every single person in this room, including a preacher, have those three qualities. Bent towards sin, bent towards self-centeredness, bent towards selfishness. Every single person. Let's just call it what it is. If we, if, if we weren't like that, why would we need Jesus? 
We need Jesus because we are loved out. And when we're living for him and with him, we avoid the sin, the self-centeredness, and the selfishness. But friends, when we're living for ourselves, those things will always exist. Because we've taken our eyes off the king and put our eyes on us. So you and I have an opportunity to change the world around us. You and I have an opportunity to accomplish these three things that Paul pointed out in this doxology. Today, God is more than willing to overrule your minds. Today, God is more than willing to overpower our weaknesses. Today, God is more than willing to overflow our praise. And it's really up to you and me. Are we going to work with him? Are we going to surrender to him? Are we going to get on our knees before him and allow that to happen? It all comes down to whether we're willing, whether we're ready, whether we're able. Because I can guarantee you God is willing, God is ready, God is able to work in our lives as individuals and to work in your life as a church. Are you ready? Are you ready? Be ready. And as we pray, I want to invite you to not think about the people that are around you. I want to invite you to think about you. I want you to think about your relationship with Jesus. I want you to see in your mind's eye the very king sitting on his throne. Inviting you into his presence. Not, not to punish you and not to judge you. Because if you are a believer, Jesus has already taken care of that for you. I want you to think about the king on his throne and how he wants to overpower and overrule your mind and overpower your weakness and overflow your praise. I want you to think about what he is able to do and what you're not able to do. And as you do that, as you dream about Banyan Heights Baptist Church and her influence in this community, as you dream about what tomorrow can bring, as you think about the next man who will come and lead this church, as you think about the search team and all that's going to happen with that, as you have your conversation today, as you think about all those things, That you'd be in a position of surrender before the throne. And you allow God to change your mind. Change the way you think. Change the way you approach church. Change the way you approach Him. Change everything. In other words, Instead of approaching the throne with a closed fist, hanging on to the very things that we prefer, approach the throne with an open hand and allow God to put in there what he prefers. And if we did that, there's not a doubt in my mind that every single person in this room would leave here changed. Because we're not him. So are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I pray that our hearts are surrendered in this moment to your spirit. I pray, God, as we each think about our own individual lives, that we would not be concerned with the people that are around us and what they think about us and our image and our stature. God, this could be a very important time for each person here. For each person here to understand that you, God, are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask for imagine. Father, I 
pray your spirit would convict us where we sit. I pray your spirit would move us to come to the altar. I pray, God, that you would do a work on us in this time. That we all can only declare it as a work of God. Knowing full well that we cannot change our own minds. In order to be holy, but rather we need to agree with you confess our sin, repent. God, there may be a person here today who's not even enjoyed experience, tapped into the abundant life, Jesus, that you offer, that you continue to offer. I pray that you would not let that person leave here today without understanding that their sin is separating themselves from their Heavenly Father for eternity unless they come to a position and a place under the conviction of the truth that Jesus, you died for them. You died in their place. You took their sin upon you so that they can spend eternity with their Heavenly Father. So that they can be the adopted sons and daughters of God. God, only you can do that. Not a person here who can save themselves, not a person here who can change for the good. Jesus, do that work in us as a people. We have trusted ourselves to be holy, precious, and powerful, and exceedingly abundantly above all men. Amen. As we sing, if you want to come to the altar, come to the altar, pray, surrender, surrender, receive, and surrender.